Welcome back students. So in the last session we saw how cholesterol is synthesized in the body, the de novo synthesis of cholesterol and how it can be excreted from the body that is why either directly as cholesterol or by forming bile acids and how de novo cholesterol synthesis is regulated within the body depending upon the nutritional, depending by the hormones, by feedback inhibition at the genetic level it all happens, all this uh, can regulate the cholesterol levels. But still there are conditions in which we get hypercholesterolemia that is there is increased levels of cholesterol in the blood. When will this be? When will the total cholesterol increase? Now basically we say that it could be primary reasons or secondary reasons and when we say primary it means it is familial, it is genetic. So as per the Fredrickson's classification, you remember the classification in which we had classified the hyperlipoproteinemias. So out of this Fredrickson classification there are certain certain one of them which can increase the cholesterol levels. So we'll look at that. Primary hypercholesterolemias include are usually familiar and they include the hyperlipoproteinemias types 2a, 2b and 3 and slight increases or moderate increases are seen in type 4. This is, these are primary hypercholesterolemia but more common are the secondary hypercholesterolemia when the cholesterol increases are not due to the genetic reasons I mean not due to the primary uh, reasons like the hyperlipoproteinemias. So where are the secondary hypercholesterolemia seen? It is seen in diabetes mellitus. It is because of the differences between insulin glucagon ratio which will lead to increased cholesterol synthesis and lead to uh, hyper cholesterolemia. Hypothyroidism again remember thyroxine is a regulator of HMG coeroductase hence in hypothyroidism we get hypercholesterolemia. Obstructive jaundice again why? One because that cholesterol is not going into the intestine so it can lead to hypercholesterolemia. Nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome is another important cause for hypercholesterolemia. What is the reason for hypercholesterolemia in nephrotic syndrome? Remember, in nephrotic syndrome, there is loss of albumin in the urine. So, how is it related to cholesterol? Albumin is a protein. Now, what happens is, along with albumin, when albumin is lost in the urine, the uh, liver is stimulated by some unknown mechanisms uh, to st start secreting albumin. So when the albumin is being synthesized, when the liver is stimulated to synthesize albumin, it also starts uh, doing de novo synthesis of cholesterol and this cholesterol is exported out by VLDL. So hence it, in nephrotic syndrome also we get hypercholesterolemia. Now, one of the uh, very important features of uh, hypercholesterolemia is xanthomas. What are xanthomas? Xanthomas are raised, waxy appearing, often yellow skin lesions, somewhat raised and uh, waxy appearing yellow skin lesions. They are usually associated with hyperlipidemias. Now, tendon xanthomas are very common, especially on the Achilles and the hand extensor tendons. So, you look at the legs and you look at the hand extensor extensor tendons that is where these tendon xanthomas are seen. Now eruptic xanthomas are one more type of xanthomas that are seen but these are generally associated with hypertriglyceridemia. Eruptive xanthomas are seen all over. They need not be distributed in one place. Eruptive xanthomas are seen all over. They are usually associated with hypertriglyceridemia. And xanthomas of the eyelids, especially around the lower eyelids, are generally associated with hypercholesterolemia. So, by just by looking at a person, you can tell whether that person is having hypercholesterolemia or not by looking at the xanthomas, especially in the lower eyelids. They are pale and they have a yellow feature like raised waxy lesions that are seen. Now, before I go further, let me just tell you that there are certain nutritional and pharmaceutical means for treating hypercholesterolemia. These are given by the National Cholesterol Education Program. This Adult Treatment Panel 3, ATP3 guidelines, these were given by the NIH of USA, which tells what are the nutritional and pharmaceutical means to, for treating hypercholesterolemia. So, as per that NCEP, ATP, 
थ्री एडल्ट ट्रीटमेंट पैनल थ्री गईडलैं नो वाट आर दट आर देश बै विच वी कैन डिक्रीज कोलेस्ट्रॉल वीट आर देश बै विच वी कैन ब्रिंग अब डयटरी और न्यूट्रिशनल और फार्मास्यूटिकल वेज टू डिक्रीज कोलेस्ट्रॉल दीज आर गईडलैं वेदर दे होल्ड ट्रू और नॉट वी आर आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक टू यू अबाउट दैम फ्रॉम एन एमसीक्यू पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू सो वॉट डू दे से नो दे अकॉर्डिंग टू एटी पी थ्री the first thing is they say is reducing intake of dietary saturated fat to less than 7% of the calories so this is again a number and that is why i am telling you about this now they say decrease the dietary saturated fat to less than 7% of the calories of the total calorie intake less than 7 should come from uh, saturated fat so how does saturated fat or unsaturated fat help in decreasing cholesterol they say according to the atp3 higher unsaturated fat intake increases the activity of ldl receptors and thereby it helps in decreasing the serum ldl cholesterol levels now the other thing is they say is reduce intake of dietary cholesterol to less than 200 mg per day again i am talking about this because we are talking of mcqs so to reduce intake of dietary cholesterol to less than 200 mg per day and the proposed mechanism is when you reduce exogenous source of cholesterol this reduces intracellular cholesterol pool and up regulates the ldl receptors hepatic ldl receptors are up regulated so there will be more intake of ldl from the circulation into the liver and it may be excreted out so that is the reason they say you decrease your dietary cholesterol so it reduces the intracellular cholesterol pool in various tissues now the third thing they say is increase the consumption of dietary fiber dietary fiber please remember are the undigested carbohydrates they may be lectins pectins cellulose hemicellulose all these are the diet, uh, dietary fibers and they are known to decrease the serum cholesterol they are present in lot of whole grain fruits uh, legumes fruits etc so they say to decrease this to 10 to uh, to increase the uh, dietary fiber consumption to 10 to 25 grams per day and how do they act how do they help in decreasing they impair the absorption of dietary cholesterol so you remember dietary cholesterol uh, if it is goes inside it can increase the cholesterol levels and it also impairs the reabsorption of bile acids bile acids are the mechanism by which cholesterol is excreted out from the body these will go and bind to the bile acids and prevent their enterohepatic circulation and thereby decrease the cholesterol levels the side effects are minimal they are basically more helpful rather than having side effects and hence this is the best option that can is available then they also say that you can consume plant sterols and stanols of up to 2 grams per day they say there are some things called as functional foods example is banacol and the pro proposed mechanism is the inhibit absorption of dietary cholesterol and inhibit reabsorption of cholesterol in the bile and they say these are, do not have any side effects plant sterols and stanols up to 2 grams per day now the third, the fifth thing they say is ncp ncep atp3 guidelines says is hmg coa reductase inhibitors but they say it is again depending upon the level of cholesterol and the use of statins statins bring about nearly 18 to 55% reduction in ldl cholesterol what is the proposed mechanism of action inhibition of cholesterol synthesis Uh, by reduces intracellular cholesterol pool and up regulates the ldl receptors but they have a side effect and that is myopathy the another the guideline they give is use of bile acid sequestrants and the mechanism of action is they bind and uh, bind and prevent enterohepatic circulation of bile acids and thereby increase the hepatic synthesis of bile acids but bile acid sequestrants like uh, cholestyramine have side effects especially gi distress and constipation one more atp3 guideline is pharmacological doses of niacin but it is supposed to bring about up to 25% reduction in ldl however it has side effects like flushing and gi distress
One more is fibric fibric acids. They also decrease LDL LDL by five to twenty percent, and their mechanism of action is to increases the lipoprotein lipase activity. But they have a lot of side effects like dyspepsia, myopathy, and gallstones. I'll briefly tell you about atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction. I am giving a a uh, biochemical perspective to this atherosclerosis you will be knowing more about this from pathologies i will give a biochemical pr- perspective we all know that atherosclerosis is hardening of arteries due to deposition of cholesterol and other lipids in arterial walls there is a formation of plaque and there is narrowing of arteries what is the relationship between atherosclerosis and ldl that is what is the biochemical perspective that i am going to talk about remember the oxidized ldl are taken up by macrophages now macrophages filled with cholesterol form foam cells and form raised plaques which narrows the artery myocardial infarction is when the uh, if the coronary artery is atherosclerotic plus thrombosis it results in a narrowed lumen plus a clot which leads to complete blockage of the artery no blood supply later resulting in infarction so here is a schematic diagram i have shown to you LDL by itself usually does not cause a uh, formation of a atherosclerotic plaque LDL has to be modified LDL needs to undergo certain changes we call this as oxidized LDL or it could be glycated LDL it could be nitrated LDL anything there it is not plain LDL LDL has undergone a change we call it a oxidized LDL i just given a schematic diagram only when it is oxidized ldl the macrophages think that something is wrong with this ldl let me eat it up and the macrophages will go and eat that ldl when when it phagocytoses these type of oxidized ldl this ldl will remain in that cytoplasm of the macrophages the macrophages will keep on accumulating these lipid droplets and this macrophage gets converted into a foam cell so what are the factors which convert ldl into oxidized ldl it has been found out to be superoxide hydrogen peroxide nitric oxide glycated products nicotine derivatives smoking homocysteine hypertension all these can cause oxidization of ldl and in all this please note that superoxide hydrogen peroxide what are these these are free radical so basically we call them as free radical damage to ldl Are leading to the formation of oxidized LDL, glycated products and uh, uh, glycated products which are commonly seen in diabetes mellitus also lead to oxidation of LDL. So, is there instead of going at this level to convert macrophages back into foam cells back into macrophages, let us look at whether we can prevent this LDL to oxidized LDL. As I said, these all stimulate LDL to oxidize. So, what are the ones which inhibit conversion of LDL to oxidized LDL? They are the antioxidants. Antioxidants like vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin E. All these A, C, E can help in the prevention of conversion of LDL to oxidized LDL. I will briefly talk to you the biochemical perspectives. Again, the tests that are done in atherosclerosis. So first, first and foremost is a fasting lipid profile. A fasting lipid profile includes serum cholesterol, triacylglycerol. Those are the main things that are done. As the rest, all of them are calculated parameters. Like they do the LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is also done, which is done by calculated by using the Fredrickson's formula. HDL cholesterol is done. VLDL is also again calculated, and we get the fasting lipid profile. There are so many of them which are actually estimated, and some of them which are calculated parameters in a fasting lipid profile. we can also do the apo proteins itself out of all the apo proteins it is apo b100 which is present exclusively and exclusively in ldl which can be estimated basically they say uh, exclusively in the sense vldl also has it idl also has it so instead of just estimating ldl cholesterol if we go and estimate the apo protein this apo protein will be present in vldl idl and ldl so we will have the whole gamut which are having b100 and the ones which are atherogenic so the non atherogenic uh, lipoproteins and the atherogenic lipoproteins we can differentiate so we can estimate directly apo proteins 
proteins. Now, another important I told to you is lipoprotein A. This is one of the recent things which are being done now routinely in all the labs. Why? LPL levels higher than 30 milligrams per dl is considered as atherogenic. LPA, remember it has apo small a. Apo small a is similar to plasminogen and therefore it prevents clot lysis. It goes and binds to an intravascular clot and prevents clot lysis. So what will happen? There is atherosclerosis because of that LDL like features of LPA plus there is clot lysis is prevented that is thrombosis can happen because of the apo a portion of lpa so lpa is also being one of the tests doing, done in atherosclerosis naturally we will have to do the fasting blood glucose levels or the plasma glucose levels serum homocysteine levels are also done homocysteine is responsible one of the important things which can cause a change in the LDL. Minute, remember, LDL as such is not atherogenic. It is a changed LDL which is atherogenic. Homocysteine can attack this LDL and change it, result in the production of an oxidized LDL, and then we can, uh, that's why we need to estimate serum homocysteine levels. Now, one more important parameter that is done biochemically is the high sensitive CRP. CRP stands for C reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a protein, acute phase protein and it is usually released in any infection. You take, you have common cold, the C-reactive protein increases. You have itching somewhere, C-reactive protein increases. You have anything, any small inflammation, the C-reactive protein is the first protein to be increased. But the baseline levels of uh, CRP are what are important. So we have different newer and newer methods which can look at even the baseline levels of CRP and these are called as high sensitive CRP. High sensitive CRP is known as they are very sensitive to even the lowest levels of CRP. So that will give us the baseline level of CRP. As we all know that atherosclerosis, one of the most important things that is happening is there should be an inflammation of the endothelial cells. If there is even a small inflammation of the endothelial cells, it can trigger the later formation of the atherosclerotic plaque. So if we can detect it at that stage, when the inflammation itself is happening at the endothelial stage, then it will be very good. So we have this baseline uh, CRP levels or the high sensitive CRP levels. It will help us in predicting future atherosclerosis. Now to talk more on this fasting plasma lipid profile. Whenever we are doing a lipid profile, it has to be in the fasting state. Why? Remember, post digestion and absorption, after a meal, there will be chylomicrons are absorbed and this chylomicrons uh, through the lymphatic system reach the circ systemic circulation. By the time they reach the systemic circulation, they result in the formation of a highly lipemic serum and in this lipemic serum, maximum amount will be triacylglycerol and we won't get the true levels of cholesterol. So hence it is always essential that the fasting plasma lipid profile has to be done. Now with this, as I said, I am giving the normal values. The total cholesterol is 150 to 200 milligrams per dl. HDL cholesterol, the normal could be 40 to 60 milligrams per dl. LDL less than 130. Again, these are NCEP guidelines which have given these uh, uh, values and you may be asked numbers. So it can be asked in MCQs, triglyceride 50 to 150 milligrams per dl. These are the normal values that we see. Now, further than that, some turn tests which are done in myocardial infarction, again I have told to you all the different enzyme profiles can be done in myocardial infarction. So that finishes cholesterol, its effects on the myocardial infarction, its effect on the atherosclerosis, its normal level, how it is regulated, what are the dietary modifications that can be done, what does the adult treatment panel tell you, what is to be increased and what is to be decreased, what to be taken when. With this, the ATP3 guidelines and the National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines, we come to the end of cholesterol metabolism. Thank you.